appellant may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Gary Montana. I'm here on behalf of the plaintiff appellants. We believe that we have thoroughly argued this matter, Your Honors, in our briefs, so we'd like to submit it on the briefs. However, I would like to leave some time or reserve some time for rebuttal, if that is okay with the Court. Counsel, you mentioned brief, and let me make a suggestion to you with respect to briefs generally. Apparently, you're not familiar with the rule which requires that the citation of points and authorities be set out in an index in your brief. You didn't make any such index in your brief at all, and as a consequence, it made it considerably more difficult for us to ferret out the page in the argument in connection with which you cited a particular case. And I call that to your attention in the event that you should appear in the future before this Court. I apologize for that, Your Honors. I believe in the initial brief I set it out, but I think in the reply briefs I failed to do that. But I apologize, Your Honors. All right. We'll hear then from the City. Chief Justice Wallace, members of the Court, and opposing counsel, may it please the Court. I've heard several of the counsels say that they were quite grateful that you've come to Idaho, and I have to thank you for having done that. I had kind of looked forward to the relative peace and quiet of arguing this case in San Francisco, but as it is, I did not mind coming to Boise for this purpose. I'm Jesse Robison, and I represent the City of Pocatello and its employees in these proceedings. On behalf of my clients, I urge this Court to uphold the dismissal of the suit against the City of Pocatello and its employees. An affirmance of the District Court's decision is supported by the law and the undisputed facts. What defendants were sued and served in this case besides the City of Pocatello and the two officers involved? The Chief of Police and the Mayor of Pocatello were also named in the suit, Your Honor. I understand the Court is familiar with the record. I do want to briefly review a couple of critical areas on the facts because they tie into legal arguments I will be making. As the Court's aware, the two police officers were called to the scene of a domestic disturbance in the dead of winter on an evening night, and when the first officer arrived, he found Debbie Bigger outside, and she was crying, she was distraught, she was shaking, she was obviously pregnant, and she was not wearing winter clothing or gloves, no coat. She asked for assistance to go to her apartment to obtain her clothing, and as they proceeded, another officer, Officer Banning, arrived, and the two officers and Debbie Bigger went to her apartment for this purpose. And as they basically knocked and entered, it was observed by the officers, Mr. Bigger actually fell to the ground, and they observed that he was holding a knife in his right hand. And as he fell, that knife landed between his feet, and in the words of Debbie Bigger, her husband then began to scramble for that knife. Both officers drew their revolvers. Banning was sitting in the doorway. Officer Finley, who had started to enter, proceeded to move to the right down the wall away from Mr. Bigger. And as he moved away from Mr. Bigger, he said, drop the knife. And what Shannon Bigger did was proceed to pick the knife back up, come up, and start advancing towards the officer, raising the knife in his right hand in a cocked, threatening position. The officer again stated, drop the knife, and in the words of Debbie Bigger, as her husband lunged towards the officer in a threatening manner and was approximately four feet away, the officer fired one shot and killed Shannon Bigger. Now, one of the critical points, and it's in the district court's decision, is that the judge observed that Debbie Bigger had recanted her testimony because shortly after the shooting, she gave a statement to the effect that the officer fired in self-defense in response to the knife attack. And I thought that was kind of loose language in that decision, and the reason for that is, and as you'll notice in the brief, I detailed her deposition testimony, which I subsequently took with her counsel present. And in that testimony, it is very clear, when I asked her the questions, she referred to her husband as an attacker, 
and she stated in her testimony that i said what should this officer have done rather than shoot and she said he should have kicked him or hit him and then finally i said i want to be absolutely clear on this point at the time the officer fired was he imminently threatened by a knife attack and her answer to that was yes that that was that that was absolutely certain and clear in her mind counsel a district judge made a determination as to which one of those renditions was most believable that's true now the issue before the district court was not one at trial but in summary judgment that's also true your honor and the determination was made of summary judgment based upon affidavits if uh, i know of no rule of law that allows a district court judge to assess credibility or to make assessments of conflicting testimony at the summary judgment level why should we allow it in this case well that's precisely why i'm trying to address this point i thought that that was unfortunate language in that decision because when you look at her statement and you look at her deposition testimony she did not recant the factual point that the officer was imminently threatened by a knife attack when he fired that was not recanted what she did and what and this is with the assistance of counsel in preparing an affidavit was to try and color the characterization of her husband's condition by saying he was too weak he was on drugs he'd overdosed and he was not <coughs> capable of inflicting harm and so she she but she did not deny that he was four feet away coming down with a knife when the officer fired and that, I believe, is the critical fact, and you'll see that as I address my argument to why this case, the, the dismissal, should be upheld. I am not asking the court to weigh the credibility, and I don't believe Judge Callister and his decision really had to either when you look at those critical facts. Well, the last, at the very end of Judge Callister's opinion, he said the court has reviewed the affidavit, that affidavit, referring to an earlier affidavit, and finds that it is not persuasive in establishing any issue of material fact. If it's... I don't understand, you know, it, as I understand the rules of summary judgment, you don't determine whether it's persuasive or not. You have to accept the affidavit, uh, and if it establishes a material fact, the parties get to go to trial. They're not cut off at summary judgment. Has, has Judge Callister made a mistake here that would cause I've us to overturn the summary judgment? I believe that it's unfortunate he used that language in the decision. I was, in fact, very surprised to see that language considering the undisputed record that was before the judge. And what I saw was that he was trying to reconcile her statement of, of the officer firing in self-defense and her coming in now and saying, I don't think it was self-defense. He was too weak. But, but when I went back in, I, and, and I, I, we never did argue this in front of the judge. The, the opposing counsel asked a waiver or argument at that time, and I agreed. And I think a point that I wanted to stress to the judge, and I probably should have done it at that time, was look at the original statement about self-defense. Look at her deposition testimony. There is no recanting of the crucial facts well, that this case are decided away from upon. Persuasive, the term he used. Was there a motion made to Judge Callister subsequent to the filing of this order to modify the language or to clarify it? Not by either counsel, no. All right, let me turn to another issue then. Um, aside from the facts, um, we have to determine that, that there was no material fact and issue. And if that's true, then it becomes a question of law. That's and we correct. have to look to whether or not Judge Callister applied the correct law. Uh, Judge Callister, uh, in his determination, um, uh, focused upon excessive force, and then he followed Johnson versus Glick of the Second Circuit in his analysis. But was that error? I b well, it was an error at the time. I don't believe he had the... At the time he was writing the decision, I believed he thought that was the applicable law. I will have to acknowledge at this point, based upon Graham v. O'Connor and this court's, this, the, the Ninth Circuit's Reed v. Hoy decisions, that that standard has changed <coughs> in, the, in the sense that when you go in to evaluate a seizure case, and it was hotly contested whether a seizure occurred, I, I struggle with this idea that, you know, that when you shoot in self-defense, that that level elevates it to the level of a seizure for Fourth you Amendment review. You don't mind our following the Supreme Court? I have no idea. problem with that, Your Honor. I, <laughs> when, when what I'm saying, that, though... When was Graham versus Connor decided by the United States Supreme Court? Well, off the top of my head, I do not recall the specific date. It was date. on May 15, 1989. Do you remember when Judge Callister wrote his opinion? 
I think it was June of 1989. It was in October of 89. There was five months. Was Graham ever cited to Judge Callister at any time by either counsel? It was not, Your Honor. So the United States Supreme Court had come down with a new rule of law five months earlier, and neither counsel cited that to Judge Callister. I, for whatever reasons, neither counsel picked that decision Did up. Did either counsel in their briefs in this case <coughs> for this court cite the Graham case? No. And did not cite Reed against Hoy, the United, which was decided 18 days after Judge Callister's opinion, identifying that the issue, uh, the legal issue upon which he was focusing, that it was error to use it, retroactive error, to use the Second Circuit approach. Neither of those cases were cited by either counsel to this court. Why? Um, I really can't say anything other than I, I was not raised at a point that I got another chance to address it, and I what had relied upon the law that the court had cited before in entering the its decision. The law was sitting there when you and counsel filed your briefs. It was not cited to this court. We found it. We knew about it. But I'm surprised the written presentations don't have the critical cases that this, upon which this case will decide. Well, I appreciate that, Your Honor. That law in that area had changed, and I just was not aware of it. It didn't have anything to initiate my reason to go we look at that change. Then reverse this case, vacate the judgment, and send it back to Judge Callister for <coughs> reconsideration in light of the Supreme Court case that was not cited to him uh, earlier, and upon which this case turns. And indeed... Uh, Graham and Hoy point out that it's error to use the Second Circuit test, which he did. And I understand that, and I would say that's not necessary. And my right. reason for saying that is that the undisputed facts, this court can look at this record, and, and I haven't had a chance to address a, a couple points about Reed and Graham that I think are very critical to your analysis, but when you look at the undisputed facts, I think you would be wasting judicial time to send this case back. And the reason I make that statement is that if you look at those two cases, it, the, the, the issue is a seizure occurs when the shooting took place. That is the seizure in this case. The officers did not enter the apartment for the purpose of arresting or searching the apartment. If that is, in fact, the seizure, and I think when you narrowly construe and you look at the decisions that are in the brief, that is the focus of, of your inquiry as to whether or not there is a dispute of fact. There are, there are no state claims argued in this case. It is strictly an alleged constitutional violation. And when you go in and you look at those cases, and, and particularly in Reed, there are some distinguishing factors from our case. There was no qualified immunity raised in the Reed decision, or pled or even addressed, it was in our case. And if you look at footnote 12 of the Graham v. O'Connor decision, it specifically notes that qualified immunity is still a consideration in, in the subjective intent of officers, and that the only place that you are to apply this objective reasonableness standard is to the question of whether or not an improper seizure occurred. And what uh, I'm saying... Objective reasonableness. Object, that is right. And but did the district judge in this case decide the issue on the basis of qualified immunity? He decided on both bases. If you look at his decision, there I is... I did a look at his decision. He mentions... Uh, reasonableness. His decision that uh, uh, defense number 13 effectively sets forth the defense of qualified immunity, but then he goes on a paragraph later and talks about the primary issue of excessive force and then goes on to talk about only excessive force. Perhaps you can point it out to me in his opinion. I found no uh, part of his opinion where he uh, made a holding having to do with qualified immunity uh, as I understand Judge Callister's opinion, he didn't need to get to qualified immunity because he said there was no fourth, no violation of the, of the uh, constitutional violation. Well, maybe we are, mis we are reading that differently. What I saw in there was he made the finding that the, the defense of qualified immunity was effectively raised, pled, and, and could be relied upon by the defense. He did. And then he makes a statement in the decision. I don't have, it's buried in my briefcase, but to the effect of the, that he found the officer's actions were reasonable based upon what they were confronted with. He, under Johnson versus Glick. Right, but he uses the term, and, and that term goes with qualified immunity, that subjective reasonable standard, the officer's intent does play into that. And, and what I'm saying is there is that distinction. I do agree that when he came down to the final dismissal, 
He made it based upon that standard of malicious and sadistic, sadistic under Johnson v. v. Glick, and at this point that no longer applies. Mm -hmm. I, I recognize that, Your Honor. I am saying that when you get down and you read Graham and you read Reed v. Hoy and you narrow it down to the seizure, which is all this case is about, and it is undisputed that a person was four feet away coming down with a knife when an officer fired, that's the plaintiff's testimony in her deposition. And that is not contradicted by her affidavits. There is no material dispute of fact in this case. You can still uphold the dismissal under the new standard without even having, to, I think, to remand it back to the judge. It is that clear in my don't, mind. Don't you have an initial uh, question of whether it was reasonable for the officer to be in that position to begin with? Well, and that gets back to the question of the entry, which the authorities in my brief are, they had the lawful authority. Debbie Bigger requested their assistance. She was a co-tenant. She went to the apartment, and I've cited the Ninth Circuit and Supreme Court decisions that say that under those circumstances, the initial entry was lawful. Yeah. And so I appreciate that you're struggling with that, but if you go back and you look at, at um, in fact, excuse me, just one second, Your Honor. Well, I'm not sure that, that getting in the door lawfully really answers the question. In other words, it may be reasonable, even though you're, you're lawfully through the door, to withdraw in the face of, of an intoxicated man with a knife and regroup somewhere else and decide what to do. Uh, assuming you have that opportunity, and what the undisputed testimony is, that as he fell with a knife, the officer moved away down the wall. And, you know, maybe you can fault that in hindsight as some kind of a poor judgment, but the fact is that's what occurred, and if you look at, in fact, particularly the Young v. Killeen case, which relied upon City of Oklahoma v. Tuttle and Tennessee v. v. Garner, they, they talked about the fact that the seizure is what you judge by this objectively reasonable standard, but that individuals are not constitutionally protected from an alleged negligent stop or arrest. So even if, if you, and I have to admit that, expert raised some issues in his affidavit about the entry and their initial investigation, but they don't go to the constitutional issue, which was the decision to fire and make the seizure of the decedent. And, and I believe that is how you resolve that issue in your mind, Your Honor. In other words, the negligence standard applies only to the seizure and not to the entry. Or, no, the objective reasonableness applies only to the seizure. The negligence, those types of issues would have dealt with the entry. It was a lawful entry. Maybe you could, you could fault the officer in hindsight, but it is not permissible. It's not constitutionally reviewable by this court under those authorities I was talking about. Does your uh, lawful entry get any help from uh, the community property laws of the state as opposed to, say, a, a Ninth Circuit case from a non-community property state? Well, you know, I researched that issue, and I didn't really see the cases make it in, as distinction along just that line. I mean, but there was some reference in a few, but basically, if you were co-tenants, I saw authorities where it was not a community property state that had allowed, that had said if either person was a co-tenant, had authority to go into that property, they could authorize a police officer to go in there without a search warrant. I think there's some, some authority the other way, too, but my point is, in Idaho, there's a statutory right of co-management in a husband and wife, she had as much right to be in that apartment as That is true, yes, under the Idaho statute. Does that, does that help you at all? Well, I don't think it hurts. I think that it, it <laughs> it's supportive in combination with when I looked at authorities outside of the Ninth Circuit, and even the Supreme Court, I think, has, has held, in the cases are cited in my brief, that, that if it's a co-tenant, that they have the permission to allow a police officer to go in there. And she asked them for her, the assistance at the time. What, uh, what, let's talk about the city for a minute. I'm concerned about the, the liability of the city uh, can't base, be based on responding at Superior. That That's is, right. Simply because the city employed the police officer is not responsible under the usual rules for the police officer's conduct. But if the plaintiff shows deliberate indifference on the part of the city in terms of training of its police officers, then the city can have uh, its own liability. As I looked at the affidavit, I did not see where, where Chief Benham said anything about the curriculum at the Post Academy relating to domestic disputes. If the officers received absolutely no training about how to handle domestic disputes, isn't that deliberate indifference? Well, and you're right, we did not address that issue, and the reason we did not address that issue in the affidavits is because, to our view, that was not the relevant factual area that the case and the motion was based upon that how to handle domestic dispute, disputes has nothing to do with the constitutional question of whether an illegal seizure occurred. 
And that is the position I took and why the expert's affidavit I found so unpersuasive, and I believe the district court did, because he talked about things of, you know, you should have investigated more, you should have asked more questions about condition, you should have done these kinds of things. Those go back to that issue that I cited before, that that is not the focus of, of your inquiry as to a, a constitutional question which has been raised, and that's the, the seizure. And was excessive force used? And, and Chief Benham's affidavit, when you review that, deals in detail about the policies for training police officers in Pocatello and that they are trained in the use of force and they are trained to use force only when they are confronted with life-threatening situations. And I believe that we have factually set out that they have that training. There's training goes on all over in the city, but that was the only area we viewed as relevant to our motion. And, and you, when you look at that affidavit, I don't believe you can find that there was a conscious or deliberate indifference to the training of police officers in the areas that are relevant to this motion. And, but and you don't think that the plaintiff in this case can state or prove a claim short of the seizure aspects of the case? That's right. That's the, I believe that's, at this point, <coughs> looking at the, the change, the direction we've gone with the law, and when you narrow it down and really look at what those cases are saying, I believe that's what we're here about. Well, what, what's the standard uh, for, for recovery against the municipal officer if you don't get to the seizure area? Do you go back to the Johnson v. Glick standard? If you're not in the Fourth Amendment? I mean, there are other, there are other civil rights violations other than the Fourth Amendment that, right. that and could be involved here. And that would be... I, the qualified immunity that was raised would address the like the 14th amendment that that, that just that whole general standard when you enter into this er arena and and then more narrowly now this seizure issue but i believe both of that, that defense was raised and at least from my reading of the decision was also relied upon in the, by the judge in reaching his decision so you see the plaintiff's claims is only a seizure case yes could i ask i want to bring you back to your argument that we don't need to send this case back to the district court um, because we can reassess it based upon the correct standard at this level uh, and I'd like to have you in that instance distinguish for me read against Hoy where we did not do so we send it back uh, for a retrial the, the factual situa situation is somewhat close True. Uh, Officer Hoy hears about a disturbance. He comes to the house. He <coughs> wants to see Mrs. Uh, Reed. Mr. Reed refuses, tells him to leave. Eventually picks up a maul, advances towards him. Uh, Hoy backs up, uh, finally tells him stop, unholsters, and then shoots him as he advances with an uplifted maul. Uh, we pointed out that under the new Graham standard it had to go back. Why wouldn't that case apply here? Well, I believe there are some factual distinctions. And in Reed v. Hoy, and I had a little trouble because there was an argument made in Reed that the court could have directed a verdict on that, those facts. And I think that was dismissed by the, the, the Ninth Circuit panel. They said, we've looked at it. There's significant evidence in the record mm -hmm. that we should let a jury decide. And when I looked at Reed v. Hoy, I saw it factually distinguishable in that it is not clear from that record, at least in my reading of the case, how close these people were, how imminently threatened that officer was when he made that decision to fire when someone is holding a splitting maul. And he originally started with a bamboo cane, then walked back up on his porch and got a splitting maul, and then proceeded back out. And it was out in the open, Your Honor. In this case, the actual undisputed facts are that that officer, as he saw this fellow go down with a knife, tried to move away down a wall, and it's, I've been to the apartment, very <coughs> tiny little apartment, he came back, back up with the knife after request to drop it, and he was four feet away lunging in an attacking manner when the officer fired. I simply, I just cannot see how you cannot, you, you, you can look at those facts that are the plaintiff's testimony and have any dispute in your mind that it was, ob that it was not objectively reasonable for that officer to fire at that time. Yes, one last little shot. In closing, Your Honors, I submit you should walk back into the relative peace. Oh, wait, I do have one last point I would like to, excuse me. <laughs> They've had me jumping around here. One thing about your review of the officer's conduct in this case, I'd ask you to go back and, you know, and I know you will be doing this, in the Graham v. O'Connor decision, 
It was stated, as you review the officer's conduct, and I quote, the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. With respect to a claim of excessive force, the same standard of reasonableness <coughs> at the moment applies. Not every push or shove, even if it may later seem unnecessary, in the peace of a judge's chambers, violates the Fourth Amendment. The calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. Now, in closing, I should submit, Your Honors, that you should walk back into the relative peace of your chambers, and you should envision yourselves with your backs against the wall holding a revolver. Then imagine someone is coming at you with a knife while under the influence of drugs, and that it is upraised, and they are four feet away, and they are lunging in an attacking manner. And, when you, and you fire your weapon after having made repeated requests to drop the knife. There is no one in this courtroom that could objectively fault you for your decision. This case is tragic. A human life was lost. But it could just as easily have been a police officer who left a widow while attempting to serve the public in the performance of demanding and difficult duties. Justice requires you to affirm the dismissal of this legally and factually groundless suit and to award the defendants cost and attorney's fees. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Montana. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honors. I believe Mr. <clears throat> Robeson would like this court to believe that the seizure occurred at the time when Mr. Bigger was coming at the officers with a knife. But I would um, indicate to the court that we believe the seizure occurred at the door when Mr. Bigger was attempting to, um, to talk to the officers. I believe, Your Honor, that one of the fundamental rights that we would um, profit to the court is the right for a man to be secure in his own home. The against an entry by his wife who's entitled to be there just as much as he is? I don't believe, Your Honor, that we've, we've proved legally by substantive law in the state of Idaho that that's, a necessary, that's necessarily true. I believe the law is clear. In fact, I cited all, all the way through my briefs that the only time an officer can approach the other spouse in an arrest type situation or a seizure type situation or even an investigatory stop is when there's evidence that a battery and assault has occurred. Clearly throughout the depositions of Ms. Bigger as well as the officers, there was no indication that an assault or a battery had occurred. The only thing that is used by the defendant officers in this situation is that Ms. Bigger wanted clothes. It's our position that this was a civil matter. The officers were confronted with a situation that potentially could have, could have been dangerous, and it did become dangerous. Now a young Indian man is dead. Um, the situation was such that they should have backed off. They should have called in you know, their negotiation team. In fact, throughout Mr. Finley's uh, deposition, he indicates you know, in situations like that, if he would have known the, uh, the individual was suicidal, that he would have called in a negotiation team. Mr. Finley, Officer Finley never once asked the, the uh, decedent's wife what had happened. The only thing he asked was were there weapons in the home. He didn't stop for 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 2 minutes to talk to her to find out what was going on. And I think that that clearly is, you know, shows that there was procedures that were lacking in what he did. I mean, the proper police procedure did not occur. Um, Mr. Robeson would want the court to believe that uh, once in the apartment, they were justified in getting in the apartment, but there was no factual dispute that Mr. Bigger came at him, and that was the end of it. They, they shot um, in self-defense. But again, that was not true. In Mrs. Bigger's deposition, she indicated her husband lied on the floor for almost 25 seconds after he had been thrown across the room, some 20 feet away from the officers. In fact, Ms. Bigger talking to her today, she indicated that the officers discussed whether or not they should attempt to handcuff Mr. Bigger. But no, they didn't do anything. They waited for him to recover almost a half a minute, and then he got up with the knife. Ms. Bigger's deposition, as well as her affidavit, indicates that Mr. Bigger was staggering, that he didn't lunge. And Officer Finley's that deposition. Not, that he did not lunge? That he did not lunge. Mr. Where's, where's that uh, come into the record? I believe it's in the deposition, Your Honor. Is that, different than, uh, is that different than uh, anything else she said on the question of whether or not he lunged? 
Well, I guess according to the, the initial police report where she was um, talked to immediately after the uh, incident, and naturally a wife who just saw her, her husband shot to death is not going to be in the right frame of mind, you know, less than an hour after he's been shot to death. Yeah, she says, well, yeah, you were justified. I mean, she's in a police station. She has no lawyers there. She has no friends. She's by herself. She's surrounded by like, police officers. What else is she going to say? No, you guys acted terribly. You shouldn't have shot my husband. I mean, I think it's a natural situation where she was in shock, and she, she didn't know how to respond. But she did no, respond, I guess, in the initial an statement. Issue that that would go before the trial, right? Which, is which time she's telling the truth, exactly. or which rendition is the better. But counsel's saying that in her deposition, she used the term lunge, or what uh, the term lunge was used, uh, and that's on page seven of. Uh, I believe of Mr. Robeson used deposition. Question: Did Shannon actually move towards Officer Finley with his, the knife? Answer: Yes. Question. The use of the term lunge, would you say he lunged at Officer Finley? Yes, he did. But he wasn't like a normal lunge as a person who do so sober. I mean, it was, you could tell there was something different about him, his reactions. But he still appeared to be, his eyes were really glassy, bloodshot. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I kept interrupting you. Did he appear that he was still under the influence of drugs? Yes. So, I guess. Um, what he's saying is that that testimony that he lunged was not changed at any time. So well, Your Honor, I was going to for, qualify excuse that. Excuse me. For purposes of a summary judgment motion, that that is not material fact and dispute. That was the argument. Okay, yes. I believe so, Your Honor. Under qualified immunity. Well, not only under qualified immunity, but for the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Fourth Amendment under Graham against Connor says that we test the police officer's conduct, even in one of these shooting cases, on whether there was objective reasonableness. And I suppose, whether it's at summary judgment or otherwise, if it's not in dispute that their knife was raised, the person was four foot away, was lunging, mm -hmm. that that goes into play with objective reasonableness as well. Well, I believe, Your Honor, it'd be our position that, you know, Mr. Bigger was in no position physically or mentally to hurt the officers. There's factual disputes as set out by our experts affidavit that indicated that proper police procedure didn't occur. I mean, I guess my initial question would be, is there any law, and Mr. Robeson has never cited any law, that would say the officers had a right, first of all, even to force entry? Well, that's the other point. What the issue here, as I understand it, um, has to do with seizure. Yeah. That's what the fourth, that's what Connor, yes, Graham Honor. against Connors tells us. Yes, what Honor. is the point of seizure? As I understand it, uh, there was no seizure in this case until, as the Supreme Court defined it, the seizure takes place when the shooting occurs, that the body is seized when the gun goes off and the bullet hits the body. Um, what difference does, in the play of objective reasonableness under Graham against Connors, when you're focusing only on seizure, what difference does it make about how the police officers got where they were? I don't quite understand okay. your play of objective reasonableness under Graham against Connors when you're focusing only on seizure. What difference does it make about how the police officers got where they were? I don't quite understand okay. your argument that the seizure took place at the front door as distinguished at the shooting. Could you clarify that for me? Well, I be believe, Your Honor, is that I believe we have to look at a reasonable officer in a similar situation. I believe previous Supreme Court cases have indicated that. To look at the objective reasonableness of the actions of the officers in this particular situation. In doing what? In, in the seizure. Well, how, I believe you have to look at to what played up to the point where the seizure occurred. I mean, if we don't look at that, then I guess it would be the position of, of the courts that the officers can come in any time into a man's home and if they're threatened, I believe there's some old English common law cases that a man's home is his kingdom, and he has a right to use deadly force to protect his home, but I think even in situations different. of false arrest. If the, if the officers had gone there uninvited, with no reason to be there, and kicked in the front door, then I think you have a much different case than we have here. They're invited to go to the place by a co-manager of the premise, so they're lawfully there. There so is I don't see a seizure up to the time that the door starts to open, right? There's no seizure. 
Well, I believe the, I believe uh, Bar Brower versus County of Inno uh, set out a three-part analysis. I believe it, they said that it's a governmental actor um, who terminates the freedom through means intentionally applied. I believe you could say that the officer standing at the door had intentionally applied force and it stopped and terminated the freedom of Shannon Bigger even if he wanted to leave. Okay, so I believe the seizure occurred prior to the, I mean, Tennessee v. Garner says yes, in a shooting, a seizure can be when an officer kills a person or when they shoot a person. Yes, a seizure can occur then, but also a seizure can occur when somebody's freedom is terminated. I believe in, in Brower versus County of Inno, there was a roadblock. No guns have go had gone off, no arrests had been made, but the fact that the roadblock stopped that person from going, you know, going down the road, that was a seizure. So the seizure took place when the officers presented, prevented Mr. Baker from closing the door. I believe a seizure took place, Your Honors, all the way through this situation. Now wait a minute, that doesn't help us much with the argument. Where precisely do you say the seizure took place that violated his Fourth Amendment? I believe in initially, well, I believe initially, Your Honors, it took place at the door, but I think the culmination of that seizure was his, sh was his death, okay, the now shooting by the officers. Assuming for the sake of argument that the police officers are there, had permission to enter from Mrs. Bigger. Based on what? Um, let's assume that. Okay. Um, even in that situation, there would be a seizure. <clears throat> as soon as the police officers put their foot in the door and opened it? No, I don't believe so, Your Honor. Uh, I believe if there's some valid law that Mr. Robeson could cite me, all the cases that he has cited in his briefs deal with criminal situations, evidence at issue. There is no situation where we're dealing, in this situation, we're not dealing with evidence. Most of the cases he talked about were public places, too. What's your point, your, if I understand your, your point is that if there was not a valid consent, then the seizure takes place at the time the police officers enter the home? I believe so. Well, I, well, I would say no if Mr. Bigger said, let's say that he didn't um, hinder their entrance and Miss Bigger had said, yes, you can come in. And they came into the apartment. He had no problem with it. No, obviously, no seizure had occurred or no question of seizure or false arrest or whatever could could be brought up or any violation of his due process or Fourth why Amendment rights. Why wouldn't we say the seizure takes place at the time of the shooting, as the Supreme Court has told us, but in determining whether it was reasonable that we would take into consideration the totality of the circumstances, yes. as we do in a wide variety of Fourth Amendment contexts, yes, Your Honor. why wouldn't that be the correct approach rather than trying to say the seizure took place when the door was pushed forward. I believe, Your Honor, that that would be correct. Yeah. The, the Supreme Court has said that you look at the totality of the circumstances, uh, obviously the, the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect posed a threat of immediate um, danger to the officers or others, and three, was he actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade by flight? And in this situation, Mr. Bigger was not accused of any felony, any misdemeanor, he wasn't suspected of committing any crime. He was in his home. He asked his wife to leave, and she well, left. We, we have that issue before us in another case, uh, which is ahead of this one, called Ward versus um, San Jose, which will come out, I'm sure, and you'll be interested in it. Um, counsel, I'm concerned somewhat, as I was with your co-counsel, they seemed obvious to us that Graham against Connors and Reed against Hoy were the critical cases and yet, they, you never, as a plaintiff's attorney, call him the attention of Judge Callister. He was flying without the help of counsel. And you never cited him in your briefs. Why didn't we get the benefit of your analysis? Well, I have no excuse, Your Honor. I believe it was, you know, I neglected to keep appraised of the current law. I was uh, taking over a new position at a new, different Indian tribe. And so I was in transition. I apologize, you know, to the court. I should have kept appraised of it. Um, but the thing that bothers we we found it, but Judge Callister didn't. And here we're, if counsel had called that to attention of Judge Callister, um, had been on the books for five months, I'm sure he would have been identified that issue, uh, and it might have saved us from having to reverse if we have to reverse. Let me ask you this question. Um, do you think that we can make this 
decision now uh, based upon the record. Now, one option is to vacate and remand for reconsideration in light of Graham versus um, Connor and read against Hoy. The other option is to say it was a summary judgment motion. If we see no material uh, variance of facts, we could mm -hmm. go ahead and apply the law of Graham and decide it on appeal. Do you think that's a valid approach or do we need to vacate and remand? <coughs> well, Your Honor, I obviously if I knew that you were going to rule in my favor on a motion or a motion for summary judgment, I would say yes, that's the way I would like to see it. Unfortunately, it's an objective test because yes. you don't know yes, how Your it's Honor. <laughs> um, But I believe in this situation, Your Honor, I, you know, I was shocked by the opinion. I thought there was clearly disputed facts at issue. My, my expert's affidavit brought them up. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that the facts are undisputed for the purpose of my question. If you assume the facts, the material facts are not in dispute, the material facts are not in dispute, would you say that based upon the district judge's uh, misapprehension as to the law, uh, that it needs to go back for that reason, or can we decide it at this level? I believe, Your Honor, is that you could decide it at this level, although I, I would like to have a trial on the merits in front of a, a judge. Um, this has been a long case, five years, six years. Um, we've worked hard on it, and uh, I would like to see a trial on the merits, although I do believe the law is clear. Um, at this point, you know, whether, whether a seizure had occurred, whether a Fourth Amendment violation had occurred, uh, I think the law is clear, although I don't know if the law is clear in this fact situation. You know, I think Reed v. Hoy is clearly instructive, but again, I think there's a large distinction in Reed v. Hoy in a sense that the officer on the scene, and Mr. Uh, officer Hoy, had not been able to see the, the wife. Um, he wanted to see her. Had he saw her, saw her and saw that she was all right, then I think the situation possibly would have been different. In this well, there is another problem with Reed against Hoy. That case had been tried to a jury under right. instruction. Exactly. And so it had to go back for that reason, where here we have a summary judgment issue. And that may, it may make a difference uh, in this case as to how we handle it on this. We'll apply the law of Reed against Hoy, obviously, but yes, sir. Uh, it may be a different situation as to whether it has to go back. Let me turn your attention to another subject. Uh, this was touched on uh, earlier by Judge Nelson. Why, whether we send it back or not uh, for reconsideration, for a summary judge motion, or for trial, or for whatever, for the two police officers, why, based upon this record, should we send it back for the city, the chief of police, and the mayor? What is there that's enough to get by summary judgment? Well, I think in those, that situation, Your Honor, I uh, believe my affidavit from my, my expert, from he reviewed their police manual, he reviewed um, all the things that were given to me by counsel relating to their training. And yeah, there's a lot of training that goes on at Pocatello, City of Pocatello for the police department, but it all has to do with firearms. You know, I believe you look at the deposition of Mr. Finley, yes, he sets out all these certificates that he has, but it all has to do with shooting people. It all has to you deal with, with SWAT teams and counter sniper um, training, etc. There's nothing that would indicate that the police department is required to have some type of domestic dispute type training. And I believe, talking to any type, any officer that's in law enforcement, that he would tell you that domestic disputes are potentially some of the most dangerous situations that an officer will confront in his career. And in this situation, which was a domestic dispute, that possibly if there was adequate training, you know, if there wasn't uh, deliberate indifference by the city of Pocatello in getting these officers trained in domestic disputes, that this killing would never have occurred. That something could have been done to help Mr. Bigger and help his wife. Mm -hmm. But I believe there is clear evidence from my affidavits, uh, affidavit from my expert, as well as looking through the deposition of Mr. Findlay and even the deposition of, of Captain Benham, that would indicate that they, there's nothing that would indicate what subjects are covered by the police department you know, it all has to do with, with uh, firearms and shooting. So you think you had enough to get past summary judgment and get to a jury on that issue? I believe so, Your Honor. Doesn't it seem, it seems to me, and maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, that the district judge in this case did not get to that issue, no, nor did he not. get to the qualified immunity issue 
but decided that because there was no constitutional violation, you don't need to get to the separate defense of qualified immunity or to the additional defense of the city uh, based upon Monell. Is that the way you uh, read that's the way I, I, the yes, Your Honor, that's the way I read it. He, he felt that there were no disputed facts and, and based on the subjective standard of Rinker uh, that the officers in that situation acted reasonably and commonsensically. Mm -hmm. and now, counsel uh, says that, uh, argues that because the district court used the incorrect standard which dealt with subjective good faith rather than objective reasonableness, mm -hmm that the very test the district judge was using is the one he would have used in qualified immunity. And therefore, we can test the case and the qualified immunity case, even though the district judge perhaps didn't specifically identify that as an issue. What's your response to that? I don't believe you, you can, Your Honor, because I feel that you know there are some factual disputes here that uh, pertain to you know, issues in the case whether they acted reasonably under the circumstances. You know, was Mr. Bigger laying on the floor for 25 seconds? If he was, did the officers have an opportunity to incapacitate him? Uh, was he so intoxicated and, and so physically weak that he couldn't have done them any harm anyway? Um, at what point was he, was he shot? You know, did the police officers act properly under the circumstances? You know, I think there's a whole list of factual disputes here. And I think it's important, um, before the court could ever got to the object objective reasonable standard, well, they would have to look at these disputed facts. Judge Callister never, ever looked at those facts. You know, in one sentence, he completely dismisses the affidavit of the, the, my expert from Los Angeles. And, you know, I don't see how he could do that. You know, there's no discussion on the, the points brought up by my expert, like proper police uh, procedure, de-escalating the situation, you know, when it was escalating. Um, could the officers have, you know, if they would have followed what my police experts said they should have followed, you know, could that have stopped what happened, ultimately happened? And I think those are, you know, I, I think those are issues or, or facts that need to be looked at. And I don't think that they, he could have resolved it just by what's bef before the court. I think it takes a trier of fact to look at that. And I think there were clearly disputed facts, controverted facts at issue. Okay, thank you, counsel. Yes. Any rebuttal? Could I say one thing in closing, Your Honor? Sure. Would be all right? Um, Jesse got his opportunity. I would just like the court to clearly review the facts of this situation and arguments in our briefs that we have submitted. And I believe, Your Honor, is that we have to look at the situation and, and what occurred clearly here. And I know there are arguments that would say officers, you know, protect the public and there are in danger a lot of the time, and, and I would agree with that. But I clearly think this is a situation that, a needless situation that occurred, needless death occurred, of a young man who had potentially a long life, his wife was expectant, yet of course they had problems. A lot of us have problems in our lives. We're not all perfect. But I think if the situation would have been handled differently, Mr. Bigger would have been alive today. They would have known his daughter, he would have known his wife, they could have had a life together. And I believe one of the fundamental things that we have to look at is the Fourth Amendment. A man has a right to be secure in his home. And Shannon Bigger, even though he was Native American in Pocatello, had a right to be secure in his home and had a right to, to stay there and not be harassed by police when he but told them. Twice, to twice you mentioned uh, the fact that Mr. Bigger was, was an Indian. Do you think there's a racial component to this case, or is that just a matter of description? No, I believe there is a racial component. I was not able to prove that. I did bring out some some things in, in my interrogatories, they weren't answered thoroughly, or they were completely, you know, I feel completely ignored. I think um, if you talk to any Shoshone Bannock person that lives close to Pocatello, that they will tell you there's a lot of racism in the police department. That's not in the record, though, is it? No, it's not. But I was not able to get to that point. I was going to bring it, obviously, out on trial. It's something I have to bring out, I believe, under Section 1983. But I believe, yes, I believe this was... There was no affidavit filed, which, of course, you could do if you right. chose to do so, if you thought it was material to the issue. I guess court. my question would be, if these two officers were at the governor's palace, or even at a high-ranking official in the city of Pocatello, for, say, the mayor, the captain of the police force, and they were confronted with a similar situation, 
I doubt very much, Your Honors, that Mr. Finley, Officer Finley, would be so um, anxious to use his firearm and kill somebody. But that's not a question of race. You're talking about position in the community, which uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with race. I think the point that, that I was getting at, the cases we get it, is not one where your claim is based on race. Is that correct? No, I, well, I, no, it's not, Your Honor. But I think it had something to do with this situation. But, but there's, you do agree there's absolutely nothing in this record before us that uh, implicates race. No, Your Honors. All right, rebuttal. Just very briefly, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Montana commented that it shocked him that the court dismissed the expert's affidavit because it was full of all kinds of allegations regarding the, the city. And I'd ask the court to look at that blue, I'm sure you already have, but the Blue v. Rupert decision again, which was relied upon by the district court, which wholeheartedly rejected an expert's affidavit because it did not fit with the facts and it, it acknowledged that the Supreme Court of the United States has set the standard of conduct in excessive force cases. And it is, and in what they found in that blue case was that when you looked at it and you had a situation where someone was coming at an officer with a knife and he fired and, and shot that person, it was close and it was imminent, they found that was not a constitutional violation. That is why the court rejected that affidavit. And if you look at almost all of the allegations in the affidavit go to questions about training and, and the investigation before they made the entry. Another point, and, and, and Mr. Bigger tries to argue that the seizure occurred I, somewhere along the way, opening the door, talking to this guy before they shot him. And, and I ask you, these officers were called to this apartment at the request of Debbie Bigger to assist her. They proceeded with her to the apartment. They did not have the intent to search that apartment. They did not have the intent to see Shannon Bigger. They went into the apartment trying to help her, and then when he responded back and came at them with a, a knife and was four feet away, they fired and shot him. If that had not occurred, the shooting part of that, and they had helped her get him some clothing and leave, I don't see how he could possibly have argued that a search or a seizure of Shannon Bigger occurred in this case. The seizure was the shooting. And if you go to that Young v. Killeen case, out of, I think it's Texas, that looks to the two Supreme Court decisions of Tennessee v. Gardner and City of Oklahoma v. Tuttle, that issue was dealt with in those cases because they were arguing, you, you negligently stopped me, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that. And they got down and they said, the focus here is the question of the seizure, is it, was it excessive force, and the stuff before, you are not constitutionally guaranteed to be free from a negligently executed stop or arrest. And, and those issues are not, were never alleged in any kind of state actions, no, no claims, nothing along those lines. They've never been raised by the plaintiffs. The court had no reason to address them, and they're not relevant here. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case just argued to be submitted for decision. Well, next to your argument in Moyle versus Immigration and Naturalization Service. You're watching a historic first on live television nationwide. This is the first time that a federal court has been seen on television.